the actual ship itself is quite a slick operation uh, and, and its purpose. I'm sure everyone's aware of well, well illustrated 1972 Guatemala where the Guatemalans decided to have an invasion of Belize. The Ark Royal wasn't far away, so the government can say, is there an aircraft carrier nearby? Yes, there is. Okay, do something about it. In this case, launch buccaneers off, refueled by buccaneer tankers to go down, show the flag, and frighten off the, uh, the Guatemalans. That's the purpose of it. It is a point uh, where British force can be projected where it's wanted. As long as it's in international waters, no one can stop it. There it is with its escorts, etc., etc., etc. That's its purpose. In the island superstructure, there's an operations room, which is almost exactly the same as other services have. That's the ops room for what's going on. The captain's day cabin, the captain's bridge, the flying uh, flyco, etc., and air traffic. Air traffic control for the normal things, visual circuits, carrier controlled approaches, which is a radar letdown, etc. That's it. No ILSs in those days. Um, and fighter controllers called Ds, directors. Um, yep, that uh, sums up the ship's operation there. Uh, 2,700 people on board this ship, of whom about 1,000, maybe slightly more, are the air group. The air group comprised, in my time, 12 Phantoms, 14 Buccaneers, 6 Sea Kings, 4 Gannets, and 3 Wessex. The Wessex were plain guard and also were used for doing replenishment between ships, vert rep, vertical replenishment on occasion. Uh, always our friend, every time we took off or landed, the plane guard helicopter was out on the port side there. Had anything gone wrong, there's a diver in the door there and they're ready to jump in and do the necessary. I mean, off the bow catapult, for example, if the aircraft goes in, the ship is going to run over the aircraft. It has to wait to sink, but the diver would go down. Uh, anyway, uh, I never saw that sort of thing happen, except on film when they were trying to frighten me successfully. Uh, our accommodation. The thousand uh, or so of the air group didn't get the best accommodation. Guess what? The ship's crew, the ship's company had all that. When I joined, uh, I had a room with zero view, seven deck, which is three decks below the water line. Uh, and there were four of us in there, the four junior Joes. Um, not much to be said about it. It's bunk beds. Uh, your own bunk beds above your writing desk and chest of drawers where all your own possessions can go. Um, a place to write a letter, read a book, um, have a sleep because it's below the waterline, switch the lights off, it's pitch black. And there are lots of noises to lull you to sleep. The shafts of the ship turning at whatever rate depending on the ship speed, air conditioning, all sorts of noises, water flowing through, etc, etc. Uh, when you're not flying or sleeping, well, there's a bit of eating at the ACRB, uh, sometimes drinking in the wardroom bar. The wardroom was about five deck, as I recall, just below the waterline. A big bar and a popular spot. Uh, the wardroom bar, wardroom dining room, we would meet up uh, by general agreement six o'clock every evening if we were eating early. The wardroom dining room was small, not big enough for two big squadrons. So we made an agreement with the Bucks. We'd alternate whether we ate early or ate late. So into the bar at six o'clock, and there were a couple of little gambling games we used to play, uh, horsing and spoofing. I'm trying to remember which is which. But the horsing one was who's buying wine, etc. So we'd go around various numbers, etc. the three coins in your hand until someone was actually forced to say the number of coins that there were within the group they would buy wine for the meal. Now this isn't a desperate situation, it can be as cheap as 10p, the old p for a bottle, especially if you've been to Malta. Uh, on the drinking, it was fairly heavily um, policed in as much as the commander, the executive officer of the ship, liked to keep an eye on what we were up to. There was a limit of 20 pounds a month, 66p a day. Now, as my boss said, this is a limit, not a target. The drinking at 66p a day, if you were keen, you could have uh, 22 measures of vodka. Not many did, but if you were a beer drinker, and many were, five and a half pints. Now that was Courage Export was the draft beer, and that was strong stuff, and it was plenty for anyone. Not normally a problem. The drinking wasn't excessive um, during the flying week. The week, by the way, was a 10-day week. 
nine days of flying and a day of maintenance on the tenth day. So the night, the ninth day, you could really take the top off the bottle and have a go at it, and knowing that the worst thing that's going to happen the next day is you're going to have to sit through boring lectures in the squadron ready room uh, at a thing called shareholders. Shareholders is a Navy expression for all air crew meeting and the QFI says his bit, the air weapons instructor says his bit, this sort of stuff. Notices come out from the executive officer, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the 20 pound thing was watched closely because if you had expensive liqueurs, you could uh, really wind it up a bit. So I got uh, one of the RAF navigators wine bill because we just signed for things like that and I used his. Well, one night I must have lost my judgment slightly because he got a warning for his excessive drinking and he was teetotal. But uh, there we go. Um, so how long were you based on the ship for? Like how time period wise? Uh, generally it was six months uh, at a time and a six month deployment would be uh, out of Embarking the aeroplane is probably in Lyme Bay because it's most of the way there. Gibraltar on the way out for whatever reason. It could be going around the Med, uh, so Malta would be a popular spot to go. Toulouse or something like that. Uh, Toulon, sorry, not Toulouse. Um, Barcelona or transatlantic. So perhaps four days crossing to the uh, Caribbean. Uh, exercising with uh, the US Navy a lot. Uh, the ship would require a little bit of maintenance, so this was achieved by disembarking the air group to various naval air stations to carry on flying with the host squadrons. Whilst the ship had the barnacles scraped, this sort of thing, then we'd re-embark three weeks later and off we'd go again. Uh, when not embarked on the ship, the squadron was based at Lucas and uh, would be assigned to strike command for air defence duties. We could do things like uh, uh, Q. Gosh, how we all liked Q. And one of my bosses was a, a charming gent, still see him at reunions, and he said, if we're going to have to sit in these smelly rubber suits, we might as well enjoy our meal. So there'd be wine with the meal, which the Air Force would have frowned on. No, not vast quantities, you'd have a glass, something like that. Uh, didn't do an awful lot of Q, never got called out myself. Um, whilst ashore, we did detachments in NATO, so we could go to Germany or Norway or or wherever, which is really rather fun. And we could on occasion borrow aeroplanes, uh, free, gratis and for nothing. Um, but it would be to justify something, a cross-country navigation exercise, uh, high-level transit to Germany and Ramstein or something like that. Not uh, common, but pleasant enough. You know. um, it made the life quite nice and varied. Meantime, Lucas base, there are lots of worse places to be. Um, Gov whatever, sailing, enjoyable, I like living in Scotland. There were uh, differences in the way the Air Force and the Navy uh, did air intercepts, etc. and both sides did it the right way, as they would be the first to tell you. Um, so we trained most of the time air defence uh, stuff when we were ashore with the RAF or even at sea, but interspersed it with low level flying and ground attack. Uh, or sea attack, the Navy had its own way of making sea attacks type Alpha, Bravo and Charlie, depending on what you were going to deliver. Some of them were totally impractical, uh, but there aren't many features when you're flying over the sea in which to pull up on this bit and navigate in this bit. It's all flat and wet. Um, the aircraft carrier would tow a splash target about 500 yards astern of the ship. Uh, the ship as long as it's got 12 or 15 knots on, this thing is a big uh, wake kicked up and we'd make our attacks with rockets or bombs onto the splash target. Uh, ashore, as I said earlier on from the PTF, we'd use Rain, um, Rose Hearty, Wayne Fleet and Tain Ranges for uh, the, the weapons. Um, I did a, I mentioned napalm tanks earlier on. On one trip I did, this is with the Navy, an aircraft required an engine air test, so off I went, um, standard aeroplane, two tanks fitted, pylons, etc. Uh, did the air test, which is climbing to 40,000 feet, or thereabouts as I recall, slam tests, down, lots of fuel left, so we did a leisurely sightseeing thing down the Western Isles, and then let low level uh, in the west, and as I was flying up a valley, Glen Tay, there was a, quite low and quite fast, there was a big bang. And that was it, just a big bang. No telelight captions or anything came on 
but something had clearly happened. Anyway, pulled up, slow speed handling check on the way back to Lucas, uh, landed at Lucas, and as I taxied in, some of the sailors were going like that. So, in reality, what had happened is a uh, loom, an electrical loom within the aircraft had frayed and had fired all the explosive release units, so the pylons, the tanks, the whole nine yards, the dummy missiles, all came off very close to the Tin Drum Hotel. Anyway, it didn't get 15 minutes of fame for me, but it was a few minutes on the national news that night. Um, yeah, I remember that one because, of course, I was to blame for it until such time as they ran the vaults around and quite clearly I hadn't pressed the clear wing bar. I mentioned that uh, we would be on occasion in company with another carrier, a US carrier. Um, and if it was necessary, this could be used as a diversion. And that's a two-way street. So cross-decking, as it was known, was not uncommon. It wasn't done intentionally, but if one deck was foul and there wasn't um, tanker support available, you could go and land on the other one. Our systems were compatible. Uh, the only difference with our Phantoms versus their Phantoms these being the predominant aeroplanes at the time, was that ours with the extended nose leg pointed the jet pipes right down on the deck. Um, and in burner, before going off the catapult, uh, it made their decks very hot. They had a longer catapult stroke, about 300 feet uh, off four catapults. So it was a gentler process. Um, ours, we used jet blast deflectors, which were water cooled on the ship. Uh, a popular cross-decking in as much as if you got over to the Americans, and I never got one of those, uh, the popular bit to get was a US Navy flying jacket, you know, the leather jacket. The more badges, the better, of course, particularly in bars ashore. Um, and from their point of view, what we had going, they didn't, was a bar. If they could stay overnight, uh, they could uh, fill their boots and get a submariner's sweater. Now, those apparently were in high demand in the uh, US. Uh, so that was about it with those. Flying with the uh, American carriers, we, of course we could do unlike combat training against, they had E6s, A6s, uh, A7s and of course their Phantoms, which is quite fun to mix it up. Um, generally, if we were going to do that sort of thing, they'd send someone to our ship or vice versa so that a proper briefing took place, everyone knew where to meet, what to do, etc, etc. So it wasn't just a free-for-all and it just relatively controlled by ops rooms, air defence, air direction rooms, etc. Uh, discipline could be sometimes uh, stretched flying past other people's ships. Well, I wouldn't care to do it against a US Navy ship because they could be quite humorless. But we were frequently, in fact, almost invariably shadowed by an AGI, an auxiliary gatherer of intelligence, Russian. Looks like a trawler. So. Um, giving them a fly pass to pushing Mach 1 would deafen them a bit and close and open watertight shutters a little bit. Uh, illegal, but uh, everyone turned a blind eye to that sort of indiscipline. Uh, flying past our own ship, yes, um, frequently, and on occasion we would be doing things called quats, which is a quali uh, qu quality assessment of weapons type systems. For example, one of the uh, guys got airborne with 13 540 pounders, uh, which is a big load. The idea uh, for test purposes, the weapons people were on board, was to drop these alongside the ship, not very close, but aiming for a mile off the ship, etc. Simultaneous release of 13 540 pounders. Well, on that day, they didn't come off at all. So it got hung up aeroplane, with all these bombs on, and these are high explosive bombs. Uh, the decision was made to bring the aircraft back on board the carrier. Uh, to this end, no human beings were on the flight deck, minimal manning in the island superstructure, and uh, I think two deck was cleared, as um, I can recall being a four deck at the time. Uh, that was it, the aircraft came back on, landed uneventfully, not even a bomb fell off. Now that was the Quat team had a lot to look at because it was their problem. They'd, uh, anyway, that was just an example of, uh, of a weapons type thing. Uh, one that was always spectacular for the ground crew on an off, uh, off duty ground crew people, um, a buccaneer um, tossing a leapers flare 
which is the thing I mentioned in, in ground attack from my six squadron days, and then a Phantom firing a sidewinder at it ahead of the ship, but it looks very spectacular because you can see this thing on a parachute, a bright light, and then the plume of a sidewinder missile going off and knocking the, uh, the Leapers flare. Rare things, but um, for people who've been stuck in dark holes sometimes, watching what the air crew do is a good plus. Um, generally in company with this, there would be two uh, fleet auxiliaries. The oiler, which I mentioned when I first joined the ship for the starboard side, that carried furnace fuel oil, water and aviation fuel. The carrier, Arc Royal, carried about 6,000 tonnes of furnace fuel oil and they tried to keep it all the time at at least 70%. So if anything went wrong, the ship had probably 10 days of sailing or something like that. And 15 to 1,600 tonnes of aviation fuel would be available. Uh, sounds a lot, but it isn't actually, because every time we got airborne we had uh, six, uh, seven or eight tonnes minimum of fuel. And we were doing oh, three or four waves of flying every day. Uh, people ask, did you do a lot of flying? Well, the answer is no, not an awful lot. Um, probably a good month would be 20 hours flying in the month but uh, all high pressure stuff at the time, all good fun, etc. Um, was there any night flying? Yes, there was night flying. There was a designated night team, which was four or five people. Uh, th these are the ones with grey hair and uh, nervous twitch. But the, the night flying team, the, the restrictions were, the, the Navy made it difficult, the Royal Navy made night flying a big drama in itself, in as much as the US Navy, the majority shareholder in this aviation game of at sea, what they would do is train everyone who finished their flying training, uh, they would do carrier qualification, car qual. That was six day landings, five night traps, all in a period of about 24 hours. So that was it, no drama. Whereas the Royal Navy, it took years before you'd be trusted, the aircraft were available, etc., for the night team. Further, you could not night fly unless you'd flown the previous night or that day. So it was highly restrictive. Uh, also, getting back on board came off a carrier controlled approach. This is a GCA, as the, uh, the other services would call it, um, to come back on board at night. The visual cues on the deck were very limited. Along the center line, there were about 10 lights, and then down the back of the ship, there were three lights called the donkey's plonker. And if those lights you saw at an angle, so that's the centre line, and you saw them that thing, it meant fly that way to regain your centre line, etc. So you're being talked down, and then your late stage LSO picks you up, or you pick up the site, you call on site, that's it, straight on in. And uh, I never saw a happy person step out of an aeroplane, you know, all particularly unhappy walking out, but coming back in uh, nervous and the cigarettes, and always, regardless of whether the bar was still open or not, there would be booze available for the guys. Yeah, so uh, here I am looking back at all this stuff, some of it like it was yesterday. Um, and it's 40 years, 50 years, some of this stuff. Uh, so did I enjoy it all? Yes, but I mean, we all remember the sunny days, etc. Don't remember the days of being in deep shit and getting extra orderly officers or officer of the watch, officer of the day, all that sort of stuff. Um, the Navy was a fantastic experience. And it's the only reunion I go to, and it's a thing called the Gash Hands reunion, not a particular squadron one, but it's people of my era with the fleet air arm of the varying type, Buccaneers, Gannets uh, and Phantoms. Um, and we catch up, tell each other. But, you know, it's one of those cliches. The older we get, the better we were. So I did just under 15 years total time, uh, man and boy. Um, in which time I only got 3,000 hours. Didn't pick up hours very uh, high rate flying uh, the fighter type aircraft. Um, you know, recently I was flying 600 hours a year, 700 hours a year on uh, long range stuff. But a lot of that uh, is of course spent in a bunk or watching a movie. So that's what's changed. Uh, would I change any of it? Some I guess I would. You know, we all learn by our mistakes, but it's too fucking late now. <laughs> so I've made my bed and I lie in it. Um, well, as the flying, we're just about to go and get in that little aeroplane there. So here in Portugal, I fly that 
the thing uh, there is a Cessna 172 with uh, variable prop, quite fun. Plus of that aircraft, which you were just about to be in, is it's got a high wing. Summer here is hot. If you've got a low wing bubble canopy, you don't half get hot. There's no air conditioning in those except open a window. Uh, other hobbies, well, we have some little uh, apartments we look after, my wife and myself. Um, travel. We recently joined a hotel group thing which gives us fantastic opportunities to go on holidays, especially in Portugal and its dependencies like Cap Verde Islands, Madeira, uh, etc., Azores. Um, yeah, uh, spare time, I try and keep less unfit, so I'm doing about five miles just walking per day and at least half an hour swimming. Um, those are the things. Uh, eating out, the cafe society, the beautiful people. Of course, these are all a part of my life, but nothing's changed there. That about sums up uh, my life here. We enjoy it. We've been here just coming up for six years, having uh, spent a lot of time overseas. I was with, in my airline environment. Um, I was in Vietnam a couple of years there, Singapore, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, India, and other European countries, yeah. So, not bad looking back on it. I'm still flying. That's the plus. Do you have a favourite aircraft? I can't say I really do have a favourite aircraft. When I'm in UK, uh, I'm going next week, um, I do tail dragging. There's a friend of mine who owns a thing called an RV-7, which is side by side and is not dissimilar to the little aeroplane you see there. That's an RV-6. Uh, so his idea, he's an old colleague of mine from Navy days, sorry, Air Force days, uh, we just get in the aeroplane in the morning, fly somewhere for coffee, on somewhere else, have a lunch, on somewhere else, afternoon tea, then back in, based in Henlo and Witten. So it gets me tailwheel landing experience again, because this is all uh, simple stuff. Except for that aeroplane, if you look over there, he's the one who landed without any wheels and his propellers are all bent up. You'll see it as we walk out to the aeroplane. Uh, yeah, no actual hobbies and never short of uh, things to do. Um, fairly good life out here. I would recommend it to anyone if you're thinking of being an expat. The country next door is not quite as good. They're not so pro-British. Here, English is almost universally spoken. Here being the Algarve. And they're really friendly folk. Nice place. And finally, do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? Uh, I don't, as it happens, but other people show their uh, disdain for my one topic of conversation.